welcome to this week's episode. This week is gonna be a bit different because you won't be seeing Hannah. Actually, Hannah is behind the camera. She's my videographer for today. Today is gonna be a very special episode because we bought our vlogging camera to make our footages 10 times, maybe even 100 times better. So without further ado, let's unbox this bad boy. So this is the newly released Sony ZV-E1 vlogging camera. So it's uh, targeted towards vloggers, just like Hannah and I. And when I read about it on the internet, I said, wow, Hannah, this is the camera that we need to buy. So we picked it up just a few days ago. We're super excited to use it. So check out what's in the box. They gave us a free memory card, a 64 gig Sony memory card. You get instruction manuals that no one ever reads, registration form that no one ever uses. And finally over here, we have the actual camera itself, the lens that it comes with. So with this kit, you actually get a 28 to 60 millimeter, 4.5 to F5.6. Um, zoom lens. So it's not the fastest lens out there, but I think that it's a good starting lens. You don't have to get super up close to your subject. So that's always good. And next, finally, we have here the actual unit itself, the Sony ZV-E1. Wow, look at that. So nice. It's a little bit plasticky in my opinion, so I expected it to be a little bit, you know, to have better build, maybe more metal parts. But I guess if you have metal parts, that makes the camera a little bit heavier. What I must say though, is that this is a very, very light camera. So here's the screen. You can open it and it flips over just like any vlogging camera. And you can put it back there or you can use it to see yourself when you're videoing. A neck strap that I'm probably not gonna use. <laughs> this is a dead cat. So the dead cat actually goes on top here, just like this. It minimizes the wind. If you're outside and it's windy, it'll reduce the sound of the wind. This door is where you put your memory card. Sadly, it only takes one SD card. This door is where you put your battery. So as you can see, we will put the battery in now. Clicks and you lock it in place like that. What makes this camera really special actually is the fact that it is the smallest full frame camera in the world as of today. I'm sure they'll release even smaller cameras in the future. But the fact that they were able to build a camera this small and pack a full frame sensor in it, pretty remarkable. Just to show you how big that sensor is, check it out. That is incredible. This is where you attach the lens. So you take out the lens cover here, you line up the dots, and you click that in place like that. Second part of this video, we're actually gonna be using this camera to shoot our vlog. You know, we'll still be using our GoPro, especially when we go on our Europe trip, but obviously this will be our main camera now. The GoPro though, will be attached to me, maybe to my bag or something, just so we get two angles, which is always a good thing. All right guys, so we changed up the camera now. This should be much clearer. Just to show you guys, camera that's been with us from the very beginning is this GoPro 11. So we have it in this medium Body with a wireless mic. So for those of you who don't know, I'm actually a really, really big camera and photography enthusiast. And over the years, I've grown quite a big camera collection. So this was actually my first camera. Technically, my first camera was a Nikon D60. I sold that and I bought this one, the Nikon D7000, which I still have now. So it comes with this kit lens of 18 to 105 millimeter, 3.5.5. 5.6 aperture and as you can see in front of me i eventually bought more lenses to suit my needs this is a sigma 51.4 really really fast lens obviously for a 1.4 aperture. This one, I remember, I bought this one in Japan. This is a pretty old school Nikon lens, but it still does the job. The autofocus is not super quiet though. It's a little bit noisy and it moves around, but this is a 24 1.8, which was also pretty useful for wide angle situations. But this, this is what I use the most, the 70 to 200 F 2.8. This thing is a beast. Taking portrait photos with this was incredible. Until this day, it's a very, very good lens. As my passion for photography grew, I eventually developed a fondness for manual and film cameras. So as you can see here, I have quite a collection of Leica cameras. This was my first Leica camera. This is a Leica M3, which is the first M camera that was ever made. As you can see, pretty retro. Comes with this 50 millimeter lens. Some argue is the best millimeter lens that Leica has ever made. It comes with this 
goggle looking thing, but actually or what it does that no other Leica lenses does now is it lets you zoom in at a pretty close range because Leica lenses are actually limited to, to 0.8 meter focusing. So this one actually lets you go up close, which is pretty spectacular. I really, really enjoyed this camera, but like what I said, it was a fully manual camera. So I had to have this thing, which is a light meter. This is also a pretty old school light meter. This is what they used a long time ago to, to basically give you the proper settings for your camera. And so this is where it all started. I also bought this one in Japan. They have a lot of camera stores in Japan that sell secondhand cameras and they're, they're selling them for a good price. I bought this a while back though, so I'm not too sure if they're still relatively cheap. They might be a little bit more now, but back then when I got them, they're a pretty good deal. Okay, so moving on. Obviously, I got a little bit impatient because every time I take photos with a film camera, obviously, you need to get it processed and printed. So it takes a while for you to see your actual photos. So I decided to invest in a digital Leica M. So this is my Leica M240. It has a GPS grip on it. That's why it's a little bigger than usual, but it helps me keep my framing steady. And it comes with a 50 Summilux. So 50 Summilux means it's a 1.4 lens. Incredible, incredible camera. It's also the first Leica camera to take videos. So, I mean, I did not really use the video capabilities on this thing because it's manual focus. It's a little bit difficult to focus a moving subject. But for photography, this thing is a beast. And I super enjoy this camera until this day. Still use it because Leica lenses are without a doubt the best camera lenses in the world. After that, I decided to buy another film camera, but not just any other film camera. This is the Leica MP. This is essentially an indestructible camera because it actually has a, um, a light sensor inside. But other than that, it's a mechanical camera. So without batteries, it'll still work. And all you need is film. So this is my favorite film camera. It's very different from the M3. You cannot compare it because this was made just recent, unlike this one, which was made in the early 50s. But this one is a beast, the last film camera you'll ever need. And on it is a 35 Summicron, which means that it's a f2.0 lens. So pretty fast and it's pretty compact. It's nice for street photography. It's very, very discreet. It's not loud as well. So yeah, this is a really great camera. This is actually a pretty remarkable lens. This is a Leica Summilux. F1.4, 21 millimeter lens. It's very wide, but it's also regarded as the fastest 21 millimeter lens in the world. It's crazy because it's so fast. I used this lens when I went to Iceland and took photos of the Aurora Borealis, which came out incredible. We will add the photos in the video just for you guys to see. But this thing is a beast in low light because of the really, really big aperture that it has. Great lens and a great addition to my collection. You guys just saw my Leica camera and lens collections. I have one that's a little bit different from the rest of them all. This is a Hasselblad 503 CW. This Hasselblad is the same camera they use to take a photo of the moon. Take a photo of Earth while the astronauts were in the moon. Historically, it's a pretty significant camera. It's a little bit hard to use because it's heavy, but if you have it mounted on a tripod, then pretty neat. It captures a lot of details, obviously, since it's a medium format camera, but it is a film camera, so you gotta wait for it to develop before you can see your photos. But when you do, I'm not kidding, it's super satisfying. Okay, so moving on to arguably the most fun cameras that I have in my collection. These are my old school Polaroid cameras. You heard it right, old school Polaroids. But unlike the Polaroids that you see now, these were actually professional grade Polaroids. These are the Polaroids that the media used for newspapers, professional photographers back in the days. So this one is a really fun one, Andy Warhol was one of the most famous people who actually used this camera. This is a Polaroid SX70, and as you can see, it doesn't really look like a camera, but what it does is you can fold it to this compact form factor. When you pull it up like this, then it becomes a camera. So unlike your traditional film cameras, you don't need to be inside a dark room, process the films. This one literally spits out the film, then you wait a couple of minutes, and then your image magically shows up. The only bad thing about this is the film is pretty limited. There's a company that bought the old Polaroid company, so they, they're doing the manufacturing for the films now, but the films are pretty darn expensive. So if you want something artistic, this is a great camera to have, but if you don't want to spend on the film, then this may not be ideal because the films 
are pretty expensive. So to fold this camera, you will see that there's actually an indentation here. So you just push it back and it collapses on its own and you fold it and you're done. Very special Polaroid is this. This is a Polaroid 180. This is actually older than the SX70. So as you can see, it's much bigger. It's also really sturdy. It's me made out of metal parts and plastic parts, but this actually uses a peel apart film. So take out the film, you wait a couple of minutes and then you peel it. Unlike this one, it spits it out. You just wait for the photo to magically appear. So to open this camera, you lift this up. This is actually the case and there you go. And then with this little thing here, you just push this down which ejects the case. So that's what it looks like. You flip this up, this is the viewfinder, and this extends all the way, and now you have a camera. It's a manual camera. You need to set up the aperture and the shutter speed on your own. So that's my camera collection, guys. Actually, I have a dark room here as well in the house. My dad made it for me, so I'm very, very fortunate enough to have a dark room in the house. This is where I process all my film, scan my film, and basically it's great to have because now I don't have to wait a few days for my films to be processed and I can just do it all in the convenience of home. Let's check it out. So it's a very small room, but just enough to be able to print and process the film. So over here is my Super Chromega enlarger. So this is where you actually put the film slide and then this will project the film, which exposes it to the photographic paper, the power um, supply for the actual enlarger. This is my film fridge. As you can see, I keep all my um, films here because that's the best way to keep film is to put it in fridge so that even if it's expired, they'll use it. My favorite black and white film, the Kodak's Tri-X 400. Really, really great film. My favorite color negative film is the Ektar 100. I'm only able to process black and white film and um, color negative film. I cannot do E6 yet because it needs to be really dark and you need like special equipment for that, which I don't have. But as you can see, I also have a lot of this. This is the Fuji film FP100C. This is the film peel apart I was telling you guys about. It's a really good film, but um, a couple of years ago they stopped producing it. So when I found out that they're going to stop producing it, I decided to hoard and buy a bunch of film and just keep it here in the dark room. So this is a homemade light box. I actually just had this made, but what this is for is it lets me see my negatives before I use them. So as you can see, this turns on, it's a light. And then this is a set of negatives I have of Maxwell. Put it on over here. It shows me the photos before I enlarge them. Can you see Hannah? Hannah's over there. Maxwell and the pool in his mini pool. And then that's the, the great hall in Lipa or the great room in Lipa. This is my Patterson film developing tank. So this is where you put your exposed um, film. And this is where you run the various chemicals to process the film. So as you can see, you do everything in the dark, by the way, even if it's black and white. The only time you can turn on the red light is when you're actually printing. But when you are removing the actual film from the canister and transferring it to these uh, developing tanks, everything needs to be done in the dark. All right guys, so that concludes today's vlog episode. If you guys have any questions about cameras or any advice that you'd like, feel free to leave a comment on the comment section below. And as usual, please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. So see you in the next one. Bye everyone.